But we are on page 56, which is lesson number 10, uh, the importance of generations. Uh, generation, the word comes from the Latin uh, genere, meaning to beget. Uh, in kinship terminology, it is a structural term uh, designating the parent and child relationship. Um, and as we remember or know from uh, this quarter, what's, what's the name or what are we studying this whole quarter? Family. Family. Correct. So we're studying uh, the importance of generations as far as that is involved with the Christian family. Um, we can understand how generations of family are important, how we as individuals in our family dynamic take a role and perform certain duties. So must we as Christians do our part to fulfill the tasks that are placed before us. Uh, the wonderful thing about these roles uh, and the tasks that we have to do is that our roles are constantly changing. Um, for example, when we're born, we're just children and we have little to no responsibilities. But as we grow into adulthood, our responsibilities should grow and do grow with us as well. We should constantly strive to grow in knowledge, and this is uh, in God's word, in wisdom, in works and deeds, and in responsibility. Uh, so in this study this morning, we're going to see that no matter the age, no matter the gender, no matter the position, we can be used to do good works to help spread the gospel. So to, to seek and save the lost, as it were, uh, which is what Jesus came here to do. Um, that is Luke 19.10. So, first question, if Jesus came to seek and save the lost and we are to be Christians, as to say we are to be Christ-like, uh, then what are we here to do as well? So he can save the lost, the Great Commission. So, what's, what's the relevance to that and our study this morning in Generations? Um... Are our lives and the lives of our family members and the way our family members interact uh, with one another and together an important aspect of our lives? Yes. yes. Rhetorical, rhetorical question, pretty much. But uh, the question is why? Why is that important? Well, one basic thing is, is the teaching. Uh, the teaching. Through teaching and through example and through the faith that we show, it's important that the next generation and the next generation learn it. Amen. Exactly. I was I was writing that down in my margins. Um, so yeah, exactly. It needs to be taught to, to further on, uh, to further to the next generation to the next. Um, not only is it beneficial for us as adults to be exposed to good and godly things and people, but it is essential for the children and as the generations as we bring them forward. Um, Proverbs 22.6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. I told Heather, I said, everybody's going to get tired of that because I say it every Sunday morning I'm up here. But, um, it's a good verse. Uh, it, it, was on my, it was on my door. Mom had it on my door forever and ever and ever. Uh, but point number two, the way we live our lives is an advertisement for those that are outside of the body of Christ. So we want to show those that are outside the body the right things, not the wrong. We don't want to be just to look like the rest of the world and say we're a member of the church. We need to, we need to show that example. Amen. I pulled up some statistics. I'm going to try to go the, through these quickly. Um, uh, and take them as they are. Um, this just to get our heads thinking of the importance of Christian parents in the household. Um, these first statistics are regarding um, households with uh, father or the lack that are of lack of a father in the house. Uh, these are from a. Uh, these facts are provided by the Department of Human. Department of Health and Human Services, and back in this is back from 1996, so it could be better, more likely worse than this now. 
1996, only one in four children lived with their paternal fathers. 42% of female-headed households with children were poor compared to 8% of families with children, with, uh, children headed by married parents. Girls without fathers in their lives are two, to, two and one-half times more likely to get pregnant and 53% more likely to commit suicide. Boys without fathers in their lives, 63% more likely to run away from home, 37% more likely to use drugs. Boys and girls without their father, without father involvement are twice as likely to drop out of school, twice as likely to go to jail, and nearly four times more likely to need help for emotional or behavioral problems. The, and this was in 96. The average American father spends only seven and a half uninterrupted minutes per week with their children, but 32 hours watching TV. Wow. I, I probably do watch 32 hours of TV. <laughs> but, Heather, y'all laugh at Heather. <laughs> but two nights ago, it took more than seven and a half minutes to put Corbin to bed. So, now, if these are true, that they're just horrifying statistics. A uh, Swiss study published in the year 2000 showed that Quote, it is the religious practice of the father of the family that above all determines the future church attendance of children. Uh, their statistics, mother and father who attend church regularly, 33% of the children will end up attending church regularly. Only one in three, even with both of the parents attending regularly. 25% of the children will end up not attending at all. Uh, if the mother attends church regularly, but the father does not attend church at all, 2% of their children will end up attending church regularly. 60% will end up not attending at all. Um, father attends church regularly, mother does not attend church at all. 44% of children will end up attending church regularly, 34, 34% of their children will end up not attending at all. Uh, uh, some more. This is a, from a survey released by the Baptist Press. If a mother is the first to become a Christian in a household, there's a 17% probability that everyone in the household will follow. If the father is the first to become a Christian in the household, there's a 93% wow. probability that everyone in the house will follow. Uh, the importance of children coming to saving faith in Jesus Christ can be broken down like this. 7% of saved children will help lead both of their parents to faith in Jesus Christ. 23% of saved wives and mothers will help lead their husbands and children to faith in Jesus Christ. 94% of saved husbands and fathers will help lead their entire family to faith in Jesus Christ. So, again, their statistics take them for what they are, but what, what does that tell us? Not to not to undermine or take away anything from the the mother of the family unit, but but yeah, I mean it, you've got to work together on this thing. Well, and that's how, how God designed it was that the man was the head of the household, and the woman Probably say the same thing she said in her latter part of her statement. Mm -hmm. That's the way it's designed. It, God, the man supposed to be in leadership. Well, also the mother, but the man supposed to lead the whole house. And uh, you get better results when you got the man's leadership. So once again, we see where, you know, survey after survey, study, and they spend all kind of money to figure stuff out. Bible said that a long time ago. Um, and I'm not even going to get into abortion statistics. That was a side thing that uh, the more I started looking into that, I mean, that's even, that's something even worse. So, because we hadn't even gotten into the, what we're actually studying this morning. The three sets of scripture this morning that uh, we're going to be looking at so we might glean some wisdom are uh, Ruth, chapter 4, 13 through 17, Second Timothy 1, uh, 3 through 7, and Titus 2, 1 through 8. Uh, and Ruth... It wasn't that long ago that we, we studied Ruth in the uh, Bible study class. Um, in these verses, we'll see the heritage of David, and as we know, who could trace his lineage back to David? 
Jesus. In Second Timothy, there's some of these are going to be some of the last words written by the Apostle Paul. They were written to the young Timothy somewhere around AD 66, 67, while Paul was in prison. And uh, Titus 2, again, this was written by the Apostle Paul, but uh, in AD 64, which was about the same time that 1 Timothy was written. The first section in our book is uh, titled David's Heritage. That's the section on the uh, book of Ruth. Uh, it's chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. This shows God's plan to bring Jesus into the world via the genealogy of David. So just so we can refresh ourselves, the um, book of Ruth was real short. It only had four chapters. But who were the main characters? Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, yeah, and I didn't even get to their names on there. I, I had that, but I didn't want to get too marred up in it. Uh, and secondary characters were all of um, the sister, the in-laws, uh, but also Obed. So Ruth, Naomi, Boaz, Obed. As we remember, Ruth's husband, who was Naomi's son, uh, died along with who? Pretty much everybody else. It was... It was a bad time. Every, the only people that were alive were, um, for the most part, were Ruth and Naomi. Um, but Ruth stayed with Naomi, uh, and they left the land of Moab, their homeland. Why did they leave Moab? And left Moab and went to where? Bethlehem. Bethlehem. So, yeah, Bethlehem. Through providential circumstances and some maybe, maybe, a little bit of meddling by Naomi, Ruth found herself in the good graces of the financially well-off Boaz. Uh, Boaz and Ruth had uh, married and had a son named Obed, and that's where we pick up with uh, our reading. If somebody would uh, read Ruth chapter 4, verses 13 through 17, please. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative, and may his name be famous in Israel. And may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, There is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Thank you. Uh, in verse 18 through 22, now this is the genealogy of Perez. Perez begot Hezron, Hezron begot Ram, Ram begot Amenadab, Amenadab begot Nashon, Nashon begat Salmon, Salmon begat Boaz, Boaz begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. So, since we're talking about generations and relationships involving that, verse 13, Boaz, what, what was Boaz, or what was his position? Was he husband to Ruth, the wife? Verse 15, and may he be a restorer of your of life and nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law, who is Ruth, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Then Naomi, once again, the mother-in-law, took the child. What was, what was Obed to, to Naomi? Was the grandson. Correct. What do we see in all this? The love that can exist without a generation in there. I mean, of course, Ruth was in there, but Naomi talked so much to Obed and vice versa. Correct. Yeah, it's, so much yeah. It's, it's not exclusive to parents. And I know we read all those statistics on father and mother, but I mean, the entire family involvement. Uh, involvement not only of the parents, but also grandparents, and in this case, the grandmother. Proverbs 17, 6. Uh, children's children are the crown of old men, and the glory of children is their father. 
So now, because it's in the Bible, I can officially call Dad an old man. I can make fun of him. <laughs> but the second part of that verse, when I was thinking about that, I was like, ha-ha, Dad's an old man. Then I got to looking, and since, you know, Heather and I have Corbin, the glory of children is their father. And I went, ooh, that was kind of sobering for a second. If the glory of their children of children is their father, what does that mean for me and for everybody who has children? That would be nice. <laughs> yeah. You, right. you better be something worth glory. That's right. And that I mean that's a That's right. Time to grow up kind of thing, kind of thing. Good example. Exactly. Our book says it's not possible to overstate the importance of generational involvement in the development and growth in godly individuals. Obed's parents, grandmother, and perhaps many others helped shape his character. And he, in turn, exerted an influence that extended from generation to generation. Family, meaning parents, grandparents, so on, very important. We all have memories of parents and grandparents from when we were young. Things that are almost burned into our minds. Things that leave lasting impressions on young minds that will go with us through the rest of our lives. Until, God willing, we become parents, grandparents, and even great-grandparents. So... When we reach these positions in our lives, we cannot forget the types of impressions that we are able to have and will have on those that are looking up to us. Uh, I can't give an example right now, but I, I still remember something happening when I was probably Corbin's height, and I'd tell mom or dad, you're like, you all remember when we were at mama's house and we had this and she cooked that and you were wearing this? And they're like, oh, no, no. <laughs> And they don't remember any of that, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And I remember very specific things. The deal is, to them, it was just another day. It was just something else. Another thing that they had to do, we got to go, we got to eat, we got to do this, we got to do that. But I remember very specific things. But I may not remember them sitting me down, you got to remember this and do this and do that. I don't remember that stuff. But I remember the day-to-day things. So we never know what we're going to remember or what what Corbin's going to remember when I'm doing something around the house. So you never know. I'm sure everybody here has memories like that of their their parents and grandparents. Uh, Second set of verses, if nobody has anything else. Timothy's heritage. Uh, These are 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 7. Uh, Again, like we said earlier, this uh, Timothy, 2 Timothy, 1st and 2 Timothy, were written by the Apostle Paul. What do we know about the relationship between Timothy and Timothy? And the Apostle Paul. It was like a father son relationship. Paul being the father figure and Timothy being the father. Yeah, so I mean, whether Timothy was was that young or just young in the faith, but we know what, like you said, this was some of the last things written by the Apostle Paul. So, uh, Matt, you know, this was sage advice to a to a young Christian. And uh, if I may, yes, sir. Uh, Timothy had a a respectful attitude towards uh, the Apostle Paul. And as uh, the sister stated, uh, he was, Paul, he he was, they were close. And Paul Paul considered him his son in the gospel. So uh, one can visualize a very special relationship there. Well, he says as much book picks up verse 3 to 7, but verses uh, 1 to 2, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, a beloved son, right. grace, mercy, and peace from God, the Father in Christ. Right. And, Jesus, our you, Lord. you know, when you look at the, um, when you look at the Bible and, and the way it's written, you know, we're sisters and brothers, uh, mothers and fathers and I think those relationships are stated for a reason and we should be respectful of them because they help us to grow and understand how God wants us to work where God wants us to to be and they are they are also reflective because they help us they kind of keep us grounded uh, if we have quarrels and we have complaints or disagreements, you know, there are godly instructions as to how to deal 
with those situations. Those are with brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. and, and we're not to, to injure, defame, or uh, uh, intentionally do anything that would bring hurt to a brother or a sister. In fact, Scripture says that we're to love each other and, and strive to have relationships that, that are very uh, healthy. Mm -hmm. right. Very well said, yeah, good. We know that Timothy was young, much younger than Paul. Um, both books of Timothy read like blueprints for those who are young and uh, developing in the faith. Just to the point, what do we know about Timothy's upbringing? Yeah, so that's what we'll see in these verses. He got his, his faith from his grandmother, right. Lois, and his mother, Eunice. So, once again, we were just looking in here, Ruth. So, we got, once again, another example of grandmothers, huh? So, um, Timothy was born and raised, so to speak, in the proper knowledge of God. Uh, his knowledge was refined by the teachings of Paul. Does not that show how important uh, the sisters are in the church? Very much so. Because, you know, they, they, they are given responsibility there for most of the rearing. I mean, the fathers must be there with uh, uh, an understanding. But a lot of times, it's the uh, women in the church who, who raise the kids. Yes. Well, you can't have one without the other. So that's why they should be godly. Mm -hmm. Precisely. Uh, verse 3, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. As without ceasing, I remember you in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see you being mindful of your tears that I may be fulfilled with joy when I call to remembrance, remembrance the genuine faith that is in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, mm -hmm. and I am persuaded persuaded is in you also. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and of sound mind. Uh, so, just like you were saying, Timothy's upbringing shows us plainly that gender differences and the different roles that are played by men and women do not mean that one is greater than the other right. or that one is weaker. It shows the gift or the opportunity, to use a better word, that we have given us that we can and must use to show Christ daily. Carly. Yes, sir. This also shows us, too, now the type of women that were raised in Timothy. They were Christian women. That's right. And mm -hmm. the children with anybody just don't work out. You know, I, I'm, I'm just going to tell you the truth. Uh -huh. you know, right. Whatever kind of person they around, they're going to have some, pick up some of those ways. Uh -huh. uh, and and uh, the jail like the crowd you hang with, some of their ways are going to rub off on you, whether you believe it or not. It's true. <laughs> so it's best to have uh, the children on a good atmosphere coming up. Mm -hmm. Man. Um, uh, the book said, although parents and grandparents can help their children in a number of ways, they can do nothing more important than passing on the faith. So just like you're talking about, Wiley, you, you, you got to have faith to pass on the faith. So, um, exactly. And what kind of faith? The book says the faith. What kind of faith are we talking about here? Genuine. 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 True faith. <laughs> True faith. Genuine faith. Sincere faith. James 2.18 But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Right. We're talking about a working faith. He was talking to Timothy. Remember what, <laughs> what the books were about. And very quickly, if we can, uh, Titus 2, <coughs> verses 1 through 8. Preparing a heritage. Uh, Titus was written by the Apostle Paul as well. And the book of Titus was written to Titus, who was a companion and traveler with Paul, just as Timothy was. Paul put Titus in charge of what? Specifically, uh, where? Crete. Crete. Yeah, he, I mean, he was Paul, Paul's special ambassador for a while, but then uh, Paul tasked him with being the overseer of the congregations on the island of Crete after Paul established those churches. He, he put Titus in charge of them as like overseer, if you will. So why? Why did he tell Titus to do that or ask Titus to do that and not Paul just do it himself? Because he had other places to go. <laughs> he was busy. <laughs> exactly. He had other work to do in other places. And uh, maybe even more to the point, maybe Titus was able to do the work 
Paul knew that Titus could do this. So, in, as an example to us, that can be a lesson for us. If we can do a work and see that there's a work that needs to be done, if we can do it, then we should do it. That's we right. should be doing it already. That's right. And I'm talking to myself. Everybody sees it like, somebody needs to do that. And you look around, this happens at work more than anywhere else almost if you're... But like this happened to me at work all the time. It used to. Like somebody needs to, and I look around, there's nobody else. It's you. <laughs> so, right. like uh, Brother Eddie said on Wednesday night uh, in his study about, about <coughs> Moses, uh, it's easy to come up with excuses. The more excuses that Moses made, he's like, I can't, I can't do this, I can't talk, I can't, I'm not good with words, I can't. The more opportunities God put before him, God was like, well, okay, how about that? And he just kept on. And kept, it, you, yes, you can do this thing. Back then, I know God talked directly to Moses, but he does to us as well. We have the Bible. Amen. In the previous two sets of verses, we saw how God, being in someone's life, can set them on the right path or give them an advantage starting out. Here we see what it means for us as growing and developing Christians to set and to be that example for those that are young, young in the faith, and even outside the fold of God. Titus 2, verses 1 through 8. But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men, older men being who? Probably fathers, grandfathers, be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, in patience. The older women, who we're probably talking about here, probably grandmothers, likewise that they be reverent behavior, not slanderers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things that they admonish the young women, uh, this is what Sister Nancy talked about last week, mothers likely here, to love their husbands, dads, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands. There you go. I like that. I really like that. Yeah, right. I'm read that. Amen. To your, uh, Amen. You can underline own, their own. Yeah, underline their own. Well, you have to know that... Don't misunderstand women for women's position being weak. That is not the case. That the word of God may not be blasphemed. Right. Likewise, exhort the young men, who we're talking about here, boys, young men that are not married yet, right. to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say to you. Amen. What did we say being a Christian means? Christ-like. Christ Verse 7, in all things showing yourself to be a pattern of good works. We are to reflect Christ in everything we do. Um, in doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility. Well, only Jesus was incorrupt, physically speaking, carnally speaking. Uh, it's talking about in doctrine. So, incorruptibility. If that isn't a one-word definition of Christ, then I don't know what is. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. Well, what's the only thing that can't be condemned? The gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ, which is truth. Mm -hmm. Only truth can't be condemned. Truth is not subjective. Truth is the truth. Truth makes people angry sometimes. Well, I know you talked about this a couple weeks ago. Truth, you know, you tell someone the truth, it makes them mad sometimes. But that's too bad. It's still the truth. That being said, we shouldn't delight in being abrasive about being right. You know, you should do it in a loving way. God's word is truth and God is love. Sound speech that cannot be condemned. <laughs> this came to mind. Proverbs seventeen twenty eight. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. Amen. <laughs> if you fly off the if I let me start off. If I fly off the cuff, I say something that came out of my mind, and it's usually bad. So that's why it's just better to be quiet. So. Where is the one place we can always turn to that we know is right? We don't have to be scared of what we say or who we're going to offend because it's it's not wrong. It's it's not it's not what we're saying. It's what the Bible is saying. Our, in closing, we are to to lead and to teach. We meaning 
we, all of us. Uh, we're to do so by example, through directed teaching, not of our own wisdom, but of the knowledge of the living word of God that exists in the Holy Bible.